Hey everybody, uh, Dave Dummett here and Albert Tate. Uh, I'm the uh, pastor at uh, Willow Creek Community Church and Albert is a teaching pastor here at our church, but also the senior pastor of Fellowship Monrovia down there in California. And Albert, I don't know how the weather is uh, where you are, but in Chicago, it is about as gray and rainy as you could imagine. And uh, how's the weather where you are? Oh, wow. Well, let me, it's about 80 and the sun is shining bright. Um, as a matter of fact, I came inside. The air condition was so cold. So I got on long sleeves just for the air conditioning inside. Because when I get outside, it's so warm and amazing. Yeah. But yeah. Not, to, not to rub it in or anything. I like gray days too. Melancholy, is, is, it's a vibe. It's a vibe. <laughs> it's a vibe. Well, you... You picked up your cross and followed Jesus to the wonderful, beautiful weather out there, and now you're suffering in it. So anyway, hey, um, yes, yes. honestly, honestly, I thought the weather was, as I'm looking out the window, is kind of appropriate for uh, what we're here uh, to talk about tonight, because really the weather is heavy and our hearts are heavy too. And I don't, I, I mean that, I mean, we are, the vibe in our city is heavy uh, as we are uh, mourning uh, the loss of George Floyd and uh, the subsequent um, uh, happenings uh, since that time. And um, you know this, uh, it was the first week that I was here and was preparing our weekend service, trying to begin to think about what were we going to teach and um, and I just reached out to you and I said, hey, uh, we don't know each other real well, but I just uh, I'd love some help on this. How do we navigate these waters? And you were so gracious uh, to say, hey, I'm here to help and, and really did give me some good things to think about. But one of the things that you said that really struck uh, a chord, really was encouraging to me was you just immediately said, hey, I trust you. I trust you. And I just wanted to say, as we got get started with people that are joining us online, how much that encouraged me and how much I appreciate that, that you led with trust. So thank you for that. Um, well, Dave, thank you so much. I think a part of, I think a part of our ability to connect is to trust one another and to, um, to learn and grow and to serve one another. So I think it's one of the great postures of our ability to serve with one another is a posture of trust. So thank you so much, bro. Yeah, good. Well, um, so let me just say, let me just start off. Like, how are you doing? How are you doing personally as a, as a leader, as a pastor? How are things going for you? You know, this season, I feel like uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina, back in about 15 years ago when Hurricane Katrina hit, you had the hurricane come, but when you get down on the ground and talk to the folks in Louisiana, it wasn't the hurricane that destroyed New Orleans. It was when the levee broke and the flood came. So it's like you survive the storm and then a flood comes through and it just begins to be catastrophic. Well, we were already surviving the storm of the pandemic and then the flood of racial injustice came through. So now it feels a little overwhelming. I f it feels like... Um, we need prayer more than ever before. We need each other more now than ever before uh, as we navigate a very difficult time. Like Hurricane Katrina, I think we overcome it, but we gonna overcome it with a lot of help, with a lot of generosity, and a lot of us seeing one another so that we can come alongside and help one another. I love that. And you mentioned prayer, and that's one of the things that we're really trying to focus on. We wanna be a people at Willow that are devoted to prayer. Probably be appropriate uh, with, uh, our time that we start with prayer. Could I could I ask you to just open us in a word of prayer? Yeah, yeah. Lord, would you open the eyes of our heart? We want to see you. Uh, we want to see you high, high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Um, Father, pour out your power and love as we declare you are holy, holy, holy. So Lord, as we talk about race, as we talk about uh, the evils of systemic injustice, Father, would you open up our hearts 
so that we might see you, see your purpose, see your plan for your church, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Hey, so as we get started too, I, I just real quick, um, I really want to point us, uh, what does the Bible say about race, racial reconciliation? I really want the Bible to be our source, to, to form our thinking about this. We have all kinds of input sources when it comes to forming our thought. We can watch the news. We can listen to what our parents thought as we were growing up. We can think of our own experiences growing up and all those things matter. But first and foremost, what does God's word say about race and reconciliation? What are some of the themes that you see? What are some of the verses maybe that have been meaningful to you? Um, or what, what do you see? And maybe especially, um, yes, yeah, where, where do you see the Bible speaking to this issue? Yeah, well, first of all, Dave, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm so excited to be a part of the Willow family. For the last couple of years, I've just fallen in love with this place. Some of the best people in the world, and I really appreciate this opportunity to really what I, what I consider to have a family conversation. I think we got to look at it like that. We got to look at ourselves sitting around the table, having a family conversation, and we want to discuss some things that most people avoid discussing, most people avoid talking about. Uh, but as we look to scripture, Jesus did not avoid it. Uh, the word of God does not avoid this topic. As a matter of fact, the themes of reconciliation are written from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. There are a couple of big themes that, that I draw to. Uh, number one, um, the cross is both vertical and horizontal. So it matters a big deal about our vertical relationship and then our horizontal relationships. The two big crosshairs of scripture is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Uh, and then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So we as the family of God, God cares very deeply about how we feel about him and then he cares very deeply about how we feel about one another, how we see one another, how we love one another. That's a really big deal. The book of Ephesians is all about the church at Ephesus who were, there were people that didn't live alike, didn't look alike, didn't vote alike. They had no business being together. They didn't have a lot in common, but God says y'all are all in one family now because of the hope in Jesus Christ, you are one family. And they said, you're in, you're, in, you're in family with me as a savior. And then Paul was like, and y'all in family with each other. And they were like, with each other, Jews and Gentiles, wait a minute. And, and Paul says, yes, the wall of hostility has come down. You are now in one family. So do do the hard work of working out what it means to have siblings that don't look like you, don't live like you, don't vote like you. You are one family. So in many ways, we're God's unexpected family. Let me give you one more. Revelation chapter seven, verse nine. When this thing ends and we're all in our robes celebrating the glory of God, he says, there we were around God's throne, every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every race, declaring holy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. And my thing is, Dave, if, if the story ends with us all together around God's throne, shouldn't we start practicing that now? Shouldn't we start living that out now? So there, there. I mean, I can, I can do this all day, but there are biblical <laughs> narratives in scripture that says, God is our father, we are his children, and it matters that his children are reconciled with one another. He cares deeply about how his siblings respond to one another. That's good, yeah. If, uh, if you struggle with racism, uh, heaven's gonna be pretty uncomfortable for you. Because oh, yeah, everybody's, yeah. everybody's going to be there. And I'll tell you what, one of the things you said that gives me hope is that the New Testament, the, the church emerged with a people that really had been taught and understood maybe from their family heritage for a long time, that there was a chosen race and that everybody else was sort of less than. And they were, they were, they were raised on the concept of, hey, we're kind of the primary deal and everybody else can be looked at as secondary and the gospel comes on the scene and those, all of that begins to shift. Now they had, you know, they had struggles as they tried to figure it out, but it gives me hope to know 
that change is possible. It gives me hope to know that the gospel was changing minds and hearts back then. And therefore, we have the hope that the gospel can change minds and hearts today as well. So, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for pointing out those themes. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, um, you know, listen, I grew up in uh, white suburbia. Uh, my father never had a conversation with me about, uh, hey, Dave, if you get stopped by a police officer, uh, this is how you need to act. Um, I did not have um, I, I did not have people. I didn't when, when I got if I got rejected for a job, I didn't have to wonder if it was because of the color of my skin. Um, I just did not encounter. Uh, a lot of the things that now I'm older and beginning to listen to brothers and sisters and what they went through, um, I didn't experience a lot of that growing up. Um, tell me about your growing up. Tell me about your experience so far. Has racism been a part of something that's that's touched you personally um, in, in your life? Yeah, I have. Uh, um, it, it, Willow, I'm, I'm just... Let, let's just have a family. We call it real talk. So let's. Just, I'm just gonna talk real. I'm gonna be honest. Um, yep. When I when I when I sit down with my black brothers and sisters, it, it's not a matter of if you have a story. The question is, how many do you have, and how long do we have to hear them? Um, and I won't even go back 15, 20 years ago. Um, you talked about the dads having to have the talks with sons. My son is, um, I have four kids. My son is eight years old. Um, this just happened two weeks ago, Dave. Um, okay. I had to have the talk with him. Uh, I, talked, I talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago online, but we, we've we been in quarantine, man. So we we finally got out of the house. We said, let's just go for a drive. And we went up in the mountains and we pulled off, you know, you got the little pull offs where you can pull off and just look out and just see. So it was a big pull off. So we pulled out and we were just looking and there was a cliff and kind of like some a lake below us. So we're kind of at the edge, kind of looking over at the lake and kind of just checking it out. Family just getting some breathing time. We got our mask on. Nobody else is out there. Two police officers, two police cars that are just kind of, I, I assume, just kind of looking at the, just kind of patrolling the area, uh, the speeding probably. Um, they pull over into our little, little, little pull off but they're way away. They're about a hundred feet away, 50 feet away. I don't know, but they're nowhere near us. Didn't say anything to us. They get out, they're just talking. They're just doing their own thing. I noticed my son who's eight years old goes to get in the car. Now my assumption was he's scared of the heights and this cliff is freaking him out a little bit. So he was like, yo, let me go get in this car, this, this cliff. My daughter Zoe goes to the car to get her, check her phone, you know, text messages, you know, she's 14. Um, and I said, hey, is Isaac okay? She said, yeah, he's just scared. I said, he's scared of the clips? He was like, she's like, no, he's scared of the police. And I said, huh? So I go over and I go to the car and I sit in the car with him. I said, hey, bro, what's up, man? How you doing? He says, I'm okay. And I said, well, what's, what, what's wrong? I said, are you scared? He says, no. I said, I said, Isaac, come on, tell the truth. Are you scared? He said, yeah. I said, what are you scared of, buddy? He said, the police. I said, Isaac, why are you scared of the police? And he said, because I could die. It was one of those moments as a dad I'd been warned about, people had told me about, but having freshly seen George Floyd's die on camera in front of the world to see, Dave, I couldn't emphatically look him in the face and say, boy, that's ridiculous. I couldn't say, like I would say, if he said anything else outlandish, I would look at him and say, boy, that's ridiculous. You don't have to worry about that at all. But it was a moment as a black dad where I had to sit with my black son and say, son, all police officers aren't bad. 
Our, our, we have relatives that are officers. We have we have neighbors. Our church. We got chief police chiefs that go to our church. We got we got so so so. But the reality is, whenever you engage a police officer, be very respectful. And I had to start going over the, the litany that had been passed on to me, that had been passed on to my father, so that we might survive a speeding ticket, because there is the rare chance that a speeding ticket could turn into a death certificate. I think for, so I hear you say that. I enter into that with you. And I'm gonna tell you the, the verse that came to my mind earlier um, this week because I guess it was last week because we had some folks on our staff, on our team who we were having conversation and a similar pain and hurt um, was coming up. And If your only experience uh, of what's happening is just watching the news, if you don't enter into that pain, if you don't, um, uh, well, let me, let me let me share this verse with you, and then I'll tell you how it what it meant to me in that moment. This is First uh, Peter three eight. It said, "Finally, all of you be like minded." And I just stopped right there. Oh, they've got the verse. Awesome. Right there, it says, be like-minded. And I thought, that's where most of us are, Albert. Most of us would say, I'm not racist. Um, most of us would say, I, I would never treat somebody poorly because of the color of their skin. And I, and I think it's, it's a bad thing if someone else does that. But there's not a lot of effort, I think, on my part and on the part of people like me to enter into the story. You brought us into that story. You're a gifted storyteller and it's a personal thing and we feel it with you. But when we don't feel it, then we can just engage this on an academic level. We can engage this on a, uh, a debate level without, and we can jump there so fast without ever pausing to enter into the pain, and I read the rest of this verse, finally, all of you be like-minded. Okay, great, like-minded. But also be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. I tell you what, it's to me, humble, part of being humble is, is to take a learning and listening posture. And then it says, do not repay evil with evil, insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because uh, to do this, you were, to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. And I think, what does that look like then for me to not just be like-minded to say, yes, we should not be racist. But what does it mean for me to, to feel it, to be sympathetic? And then what does it mean for someone like me to bless? Um, and I'll just tell you, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And I am. Yeah. I'm listening to you and I'm saying, okay, God has given me some sort of platform, some sort of authority, some sort of role. How do I use that role the best way possible? And, and I don't know yet. And I'm, yeah. I'm still thinking through that. Well, but, Dave, I, um, um, I, I appreciate that passage. Um, family, I'm going to, I'm going to say something that's very honest. Um, and that's very hard. It's, it's, um, it's, it's very honest, but it's very hard. I've been working in multi-ethnic spaces, um, working in white evangelical churches for many years now. And um, Dave, that verse is so powerful, man. It's so powerful. One of, and I'm just gonna be honest, y'all. I'm just gonna share my heart with you because, because I love you and I want us to grow in our ability to have this conversation well. And we really can't grow if we don't, if we don't stand in fullness of truth, in fullness and truth. Um, 
one of the greatest sources of disappointment and what appears to be anger, but anger we know is a second emotion. It's always covering up something that's deeper in that sadness. One of the greatest sure. sources of sadness is the lack of sympathy and compassion from my white siblings in seasons of pain in the face of injustice. So Martin Luther King says a quote, and I think it's so appropriate when he was going through the heat of the civil rights movement, he said the biggest threat isn't, isn't the, 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 the loud, angry racist, the biggest threat to reconciliation. That's not, that's not, that's it. But the biggest threat, he says, is the silence of the moderate whites who are just indifferent. And, and I think what's been so at times discouraging is for our community and as a black person to experience and see injustice and to be in painful tears. And the posture of my white siblings is you got to justify those tears because I just don't believe them because you're ha because you have them. I just don't believe them because they're coming down your face. So Ahmaud Arbery, um, a, a lot of people um, saw that video and a lot of my white Christian siblings have shown up and expressed. But but to be honest, there's a little frustration because it says it took a perfect video for you to believe my tears, for you to believe the my experience of a lack of justice. And, and, and I, and I want to unpack uh, what could potentially be a trigger word, and I want to unpack it because I, I want us to lovingly see this as a family. As a family, I want us to see this. So when we have these Black bodies that are being killed unarmed and the, and and we we love police if you look at the if you look at the amount of minorities that are in police force and military i got uncles cousins that are police officers there's no there's no doubt that we support unapologetically police officers in the sacrificial work that they do however with any organization just like good police officers we should all want bad policing to stop especially when it's, see, it's systemically perpetuated and we can all agree that we don't want to see that happen. Mm -hmm. So when we come up and we say, and here's a trigger word, Black Lives Matter. That phrase was not an organization or a set of theological beliefs. It was a declaration and a plea to be seen, to be heard and to be respected. Um, when we say that, and then to hear a resounding all lives matter creates this conundrum, right? And, and we've almost kind of divided over the phrases. We've kind of divided over. That just goes to show how, how hard it is. Um, we don't do that with anything else. We don't, we don't do that with any Thing else. If anybody else has a crisis, we say Boston. We all we all with you. Uh, if uh, Jewish Jewish community, we all with you. That is terrible. That's that. In the black community, we we just say we want to matter, and we say no, nah, we all matter. Here here's what this is like. I'll give you two examples, and then I'll stop monologuing because I know this is supposed to be me and you going back and forth, but one of us <laughs> longer than the That's other. That's okay. They um, want you. They want to hear you. <laughs> um, it's kind of like my son getting into a fight at school. And in order to find confidence in himself, he comes in the house and he says, I don't care what that guy, that bully says, I matter. And I go to him and I said, no, son, Isaac, all of my children matter. Hmm. Dad, but I don't care what that, I matter. It's like, yeah, son, I have four children. It is not okay for me to just sit here and look at you. I know you, I know you got beat up today and I know you had the worst day of your life. And I know you're looking to be seen and appreciated and respected, but all my children matter. Yeah. See, that's problematic. Uh, if, a, if, if here's a popular one that most people have probably heard before, but if a house is on fire in a neighborhood and the, and the fire truck and everybody's running to that house and pouring fire and my neighbor comes out furious, he says, Hey, why y'all? 
All the, why y'all putting all this into that house? My house matters too. And then I'll go to my neighbor and say, yeah, bro, I know your house matters, but mine is on fire right now. So is it okay that we put more attention on mine for a moment because it's burning down to the ground? When black brothers and sisters are crying out, it's not a theological statement because I get that there are uh, there's an organization, Black Lives Matter, and there's a declaration. We're making yeah. a declaration. We're not identifying with the organization. Just like when we do sex trafficking, we're not identifying with all the organizations that theologically that do sex trafficking. We're saying we want to go after sex trafficking because it's something that's wrong and we need to stamp it out. We need to shout their words. So when we say this declaration, Black Lives Matter, and our white siblings come and say, no, all lives matter. I agree with that statement, but can we also agree that right now our house is on fire? And, I, yeah. and as a Christian sibling, I could really use some water for my brother and sister. Not a time to critique or debate. I could really use some water. So I'd love, instead of picking up a picket sign in opposition of my declaration, you pick up your holes and help me put my fire out so that we can be one community. When you talk about that passage, Dave, that's what I think about, um, to, to be, to, to, to support one another, to sympathy um, and compassion. That compassion looks like bringing water to my house that's on fire, not bringing a picket sign declaring that all houses matter. That's, that's so good. and. It is a shame, I think it's a shame, that the declaration has been co-opted uh, to the point that it is now politicized and, you know, one thing necessarily, you know, if, if I identify with the declaration that I will, I automatically identify with everything, uh, you know, every uh, the, the politics of that side or the... And that's not how it started. It started, like you said, as a cry for people to say, look at us, we're hurting, look at us, we want to matter more to you. And uh, I, I've, heard, I, I've heard the folks uh, debating about all lives matter, I've heard blue, li you know, blue lives matter, all this sort of thing. And um, I tell you that, that in particular, you said it's a trigger word. I've seen it. I've seen it on our staff. I've seen it as we've thought through things. Uh, it is a trigger and it's a shame that so many that either organizations, or it's been so polarizing because how different groups have co-opted that, um, that phrase. Um, hmm. Yeah, so that's the struggle that 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 is the struggle with um african americans trying to find a voice um to to acknowledge the injustice that is perpetual dave the greatest threat even to this conversation that we're having right now the greatest enemy to racial reconciliation <sighs> there are many but one of the biggest is for my white siblings, whom I love dearly, to not see it. And if they don't see it, they won't think it's real. And if they don't think it's real, there's no opportunity for the Holy Spirit to bring about conviction, healing, yeah. repentance, or restoration, because it's something that doesn't exist. And you know what shocked me? There are systems and organizations committing, committed to making sure that people don't see it. And, all, and also, parenthetically, I'm saying my white siblings, there are also black folks that that don't see it. It ain't a lot, but there are black people that everything I'm saying right here, right now, they will they will get on the news and disagree with it and try to help, try to encourage people to believe that this is not a problem. But my brothers and sisters, it's a problem and it's a biblical problem. It's a spiritual problem. Are you, Albert, are you encouraged um, I can't remember the professor's name. I think his first name is or maybe maybe his first name is Orlando or second. He's a sociologist at Harvard. He said one of the things that he was most encouraged by in these, if you can be encouraged by uh, protests and riots, but he said that he saw because he was around for the '67 riots and the, 
he said he was very encouraged by the number of white brothers and sisters that were joining in. Um, I, and I, and I feel like I've seen that. I feel like I saw, I saw people joining in on marches, protests that I went, Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know that you would go do that. And that's pretty cool. Um, has that been encouraging to you or has that been something you've noticed? Absolutely. I've had more people sending me personal messages saying, Albert, I, I repent for my inaction in the conversation. I just didn't know, or I've just been checked out or I've willfully, um, not seen it as a, as a problem that, that has anything to do with me, but I feel like it's going to require that in Christians, the body of Christ, this is who we are. This is what God has called us to be. We should of course be engaged in this issue. We should of course be engaged in standing on behalf of our brothers and sisters who are our spiritual siblings. If we're not standing with them, what are we doing? But we've got a culture that has normalized segregation, that has normalized divide, that has normalized white church, black church, and we've got a culture that's got us acting more like elephants and donkeys than we are Christians. We don't serve the donkey. We don't serve the elephant. We serve the lamb. And we've got to start acting like lambs. So lambs will not look at a party, but they'll look at a policy. But our, ideolo our, our idolatry of party, our idolatry of left and right has caused us not to even see hurting and injustice that's sitting right in front of our very eyes. So we'll politicize everything because if we politicize everything, we'll end up doing nothing and perpetual injustice will continue to happen forever and ever on the church's watch. So I'm convinced, man, that it is the church's role to stand up and not in celebration of party, but in celebration of the policies that come from the kingdom of God with the lamb as our ambassador, we pursue the full body of Christ. So in order for this to change, we got to have white people uh, protesting. We got to have white people putting up on their on their pages coming because the goal is not just to not be racist. That's not the goal. We need you to stand in opposition of racism. Oh, yeah. We it, the goal is not for you to say, "I see the injustice." That ain't a, it's kind of like this, and this is graphic. So forgive me uh, for the for the graphic picture, but it's like we're in the same house, and we're siblings. But our our father is abusing me, but not abusing you, and he does this for years and years. And one day you come to me and say, hey, I just want you to know. I see that our father is abusing you and it's not OK. And then you just go to sleep at night and ignore the abuse. Yeah. You don't call dad out. You don't stand in opposition of it. So, yeah, I appreciate you seeing it. I appreciate you saying it. But as my sibling, I need you to do something about it. So no, I'm not going to give you a victory lap just because, oh, man, I see it. I saw it and I know it's happening. I don't need you to say, and it's not me. I'm not doing it. I don't think it's right. I don't need you to just say I'm not a racist. I need you to say, Albert, I see it and I'm going to stand against it. So wherever it rears its ugly head, if my Uncle Bob is at the Thanksgiving dinner table and he says a racist joke, I'm going to create a holy, awkward moment at my dinner table and say, hey, Uncle Bob, that's not OK. That's not OK. I'm going to stand against it wherever it rears its ugly head. That's what we need from our siblings in this moment. So, yes, it's going to take a collective kingdom voice to tear Satan's kingdom down of racism and injustice. My amen. My fear is that people will hear you and say amen in the moment moment. Uh, it is, uh, we're feeling the emotion right now. Uh, we're seeing it on the news. We love you. Um, but then all this is going to die down for the, you know, the suburban white folks. It's just, it's all going to die down and we're going to move on to the next news story. And I agree with you that when uncle Bob makes a racist joke, uh, okay, then I might do something. Um, when, um, uh, you know, the next time somebody puts something on social media, maybe I'll, uh, say something. 
But is it enough to be responsive, to be reactive, or should we be proactive? Is there, are there ways that we can be proactive um, to, to combat racism? Oh, yeah, this is huge. And this is where, Dave, this is where we have to have leaders like yourself to be brave and courageous as we lead organizations, a great church like Willow to say, yeah, we're, we're not going to be preaching on racial injustice because it's in the headline. We're not going to be res- we're not going to be reacting to the headlines. We're going to be preaching this message as a response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So calling people to a holistic vision and view of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where Jesus is emphatic about his love for the other. So being intentional at Willow, being intentional at fellowship to to create a culture where people come and they break the cycle of the echo chamber. Whereas my news reaffirms my beliefs. My friends reaffirm my beliefs. My uh, The articles I read reaffirm my belie- belief. No, no, no. We create cultures, Dave, where people gather together that don't look alike, don't live alike, don't vote alike. And they come together as the body of Christ and wrestle through the outworkings of the gospel. Then that shapes how we stand for one another in times of crisis. It shapes how we defend and come to the, to the defense of brothers and sisters who who are experiencing oppression. It shapes how if we if we have this strong stance against abortion, it's not just abortion, but we care from the womb to the tomb. So yes, we want to stand in opposition to abortion. So we want to stamp out and create mentoring programs and education and pathways to college for kids that are highly vulnerable for 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 those those kinds of things, the the neighborhoods that Planned Parenthood shows up in, we need to show up in those neighborhoods with after school care programs, with with projects to build and invest in human life. If we're gonna be pro life, let's take it all away and let's be pro the whole life, not just pro birth. So it causes us to get our hands dirty. It causes us to get intentional. It causes us to build churches and organizations that say. Um, Black Lives Matter. Um, that when when Corona uh, started out, um, the Asian community in our church, we got tons of feedback. Said, "Yo, we we've been more um, targeted, uh, hate uh, crimes and, and violations, violent acts against Asian people ticked up like over overnight. The stats are there. That was a time for us as a church to say, hey, Asian lives matter." And we showed up for our Asian community the best we could, intentionally checking on them, intentionally standing against rhetoric that would make them feel targeted in the time of coronavirus. It's, ama- it's amazing the emails that I got of people. Because a part of you think, to be honest, you think it ain't happening to me. So it, it probably ain't people. Ain't really, or that's one isolated event. No, bro. We got tons of emails from people that are faithful, who are lovers of Jesus Christ. They say when they walk in the grocery store. People are responding to them in ways that are hostile. People, so it was a moment for us to show up for them and say, "Asian lives matter." Every Sunday, we declare all lives matter. Every every week, if you preach in that book, we declaring that the life we're all made in the Imago Day. But there are moments in this sinful world where we got to show up for people in moments of devastation to say, "I know everybody matter, but I'm at the funeral of your son. So today, I want you to hear it a resounding: your life matters." Because do you know what the enemy is saying? The enemy is saying, you don't matter. You don't matter. You don't matter. Mm -hmm. You don't have worth. The culture doesn't like you. You are this, you are that, you are second class, you know? So so all the rhetoric of the world, because you you see these injustices, the enemy is just saying, you don't matter. So our Christian siblings need to be able to come and say, oh no, you matter. The devil is a liar. Your life matters. Who you are matters. How God made you matters. Your culture matters. And we won't let our society and our world tell you otherwise. Because if we stay silent, that's what the world tells black lives. Mm -hmm. During this coronavirus, my Asian friends will say, that's what the world was telling them. America was saying, you don't matter. You don't, you don't matter. You say, and we had to stop and say, no, you matter, bro. Native Indians, you matter. So, so it's, it's, it's a Christian ethic. Don't make it political, make it kingdom. And if you make yeah. a kingdom, you'll see an opportunity to sympathize and to show compassion instead of defending and critiquing. There's a time yeah. for that. And there's a time for, let's unpack these, these truths. Let's look at the, but at a funeral, 
I don't need you to come with your logical explanation of what went wrong. At a funeral, I need you to sit your behind down next to me, hold my hand and let me cry. That's good. I think Jesus did that at a funeral. He had all the solutions. He had all, all the solutions ready to go, right? I mean, he could have come in. He knew what he was going to do. And yet when he comes into the situation, he weeps. He enters yeah. into uh, the pain of other people. And uh, we, we do pretty well to follow his example. Hey, wow. what's next uh, at your church? Uh, you This was part of the vision for your church when you began. Was it eight or nine years ago that you started wow. Fellowship Monrovia? And, uh, you know, this was a part of your vision to be a multi-ethnic, intergenerational uh, gospel church. And uh, what are you guys doing right now that you think it, where you're winning? What are, what are the, the innovations? What are the things where you're seeing racial, racial reconciliation happening? Um, and then what's next? What, what are you going to be working on? Uh, what's the challenge for you all going forward? Yeah, I think um, I just have this vision of a family table. And at that table, having all the diversity, um, <laughs> I tell you, it's the hardest time uh, in the history of our church to be a multi-ethnic church. It's so hard right now because everybody in crisis and when this kind of stuff hits, everybody goes to their corner, their Republican corner, their Democratic corner, their uh, Latino corner, their Asian corner, their white corner, their black corner. Everybody goes and they, do, but I'm fighting, man, because this table is a stained table with the blood of the lamb. And I'm fighting for us to sit at this table and I'm not content without having the full family represented. And it's the same it's thing for Willow. So, go ahead. Well, I was, it's it's worth it. I mean, it's worth it. It's worth it to sit there and have those hard conversations. I hope you and I are modeling that a little bit. Um, you know, it's worth it to to work on that relationship because if the church can get it right, first of all, who else is going to get it right? They, you know, it, it, the gospel is, is is where it happens, and so if the church can get it right, then there's hope for it to happen in the world. So it's, yeah. it's worth it to fight through that. The Church of Jesus Christ is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. I know you guys have heard that before, and it's so serious. But you got to know, God God is like, I don't want my church to be segregated, though. I don't, if my, my kids, I got four kids, if they were segregated and refused to engage with one another, and they were fighting over who was more important and who mattered and who was hurt, and I don't believe you're hurt, and I don't, you're hurt for another reason, well, we hurt too. Oh, my God. We're the Church of Jesus Christ. We got a bloodstained table and he made a sacrifice so that we all might deny ourselves and come together. And when we see injustice, when we see our brothers and sisters hurt, we go and we empathize. We show compassion and we stand against whatever that system is that's disproportionately hurting them. We don't just acknowledge it and then keep on singing songs of worship together. No, we get in a, we get in a fighting posture. The weapons are, of our warfare are not carnal, but they are divine from God and powerful to the pulling down of strongholds. I'm convinced, Dave, if we get together as the body of Christ and says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places, my my fight ain't white people. My fight ain't black people. My fight ain't Asians or Latinos. My fight is spiritual wickedness. So however it shows up, we want to call it down. I long for the day when we're shaped by the B-I-B-L-E, not CNN, not Fox, not MSNBC, but the B-I-B-L-E. And we allow that to drive our ethic. Our policies are driven by policy and not party. At our church, at Willow, um, and at the Church of Jesus Christ, Dave, I just think we got a big opportunity here to move the conversation forward. I think we got a big opportunity to be intentional about this issue, that it's not just a reaction to a headline, but we got an opportunity to respond to the gospel and lead the church to be a witness to the world. I pray that they would look at me and you and the Willow team and say, how in the world are all those folks coming together? They got folks from all different theological backgrounds, political backgrounds, racial backgrounds. But look at them. Not only are they worshiping together, but they are advocating for one another. They're standing at, see, because the temptation will be that the church in this moment will pursue and settle for cheap reconciliation instead of deep reconciliation. And let me just tell you something. 
if you don't feel uncomfortable, if you don't feel the temptation to be <laughs> defensive, if you don't feel the temptation to disqualify my perspective, yeah. if I ain't irritated something that I, if I ain't irritated you in any kind of way, even if it's just the way my face looks, if we gonna have deep reconciliation, we gotta have some divine irritation. Mm. We we gotta have some divine irritation. So the co- the conversation ain't gonna be comfortable. But the question is, before you fire off your email to Pastor Dave, or before you send send me your email, which my email is uh, Dave at Willow. Uh, creek.com. That's my email. So before you fire off your ticked off email, because I can't believe he said Black Lives Matter. I can't believe he criticized the Democratic. I guess, folk, I get hit. I don't know about you that I get hit from the left and the right. I ain't left enough. I ain't right enough. You, but by make, God's you make it grace, mad. Yeah, by God's grace, I'm kingdom enough, though. I'm kingdom enough, and I'm trying to forge something And it's hard. It's sacrificial. You're not going to be comfortable. God didn't call us to comfort. God called us to kingdom. So the question is, Willow, fellowship, are we willing to be churches that are willing to be uncomfortable so that we might make room for everybody to be at the table? Can you imagine? uh, Can you imagine people describing just just at a conference, Albert, just uh, in passing, maybe the maybe the newspaper headlines, you know, Willow's been in the papers a little bit in the last couple of years. Can you imagine when they no mention Willow Creek in, in the papers in the coming years, Willow Creek, comma, a multi-ethnic church, comma. You know, that was part of your vision from the beginning. It ought to be a part of every church's vision. And so, my goodness, wouldn't it be great if we were actually described in that way? Oh, that church over there, that's a multi-ethnic church. Well, it's amazing. Uh, Dave, that's, yep. it's not just a, it's, it's, it's not even just a dream, Dave, bro, with you coming here and with the leadership, uh, me and Megan being part of your team, I'm telling you, if we going to fight to that end and we'll be able to look back and play this video and celebrate and thank God and say, by God's grace, it happened. It's, it's something, um, geographically, there are some places where they, it just can't happen. It's just geographically impossible. Uh, Chicago land, I think we can pull it off. Um, and I think that could be one of the greatest testaments and testimonies. That's why I'm excited to be a part of the Willow family. I'm excited to continue this conversation, which I know it's hard and uncomfortable. Some of you already write an email right now. I challenge you, put down, put down your Word document and pick up your Word document, the B-I-B-L-E, sit with it and reflect and spend some time listening because in order for us to get there with this table... You can't be defensive the whole time. You got to sit and listen to the burdens of your brothers and sisters as we listen to one another so that God might move us all forward so that Willow Creek will be that Willow Creek Church, community church, multi-ethnic, intergenerational, and pursuing God's purposes for all people to sit at the table. I'm excited. I'm excited. (laughs) I love it. Hey, I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but I think you have a future in preaching. You may want to try it sometime, okay? If not, I got hey. a future in talking a lot. But <laughs> <laughs> well, it's six fifty-four uh, by my clock. Are we going to take any questions? Uh, we said we might open it up to some questions, or I don't know if we have some. I'm looking at folks that are helping us. They're saying not a lot happening in that. Well, we can we can wrap it up. Any last thing that you want to say or ask, um, Albert? Anything that we need to touch on before we go? Well, Dave, my number one, I'm so thankful for your leadership at Willow. Um, my encouragement to you, and and I'm encouraging you, I'm doing it publicly because I know you've already said it privately, but my encouragement to you is that we would make this conversation a priority, that it's a biblical priority, not kind of like an extracurricular deal. It's a part of who God has called the church to be, and I'm so inspired um, by the vision of us becoming that. And so I just want to encourage you. I pray that this is the first of many conversations. I pray that uh, as we work through hard times that we would love one another. One of the biggest challenges, man, is when people at church hear something they don't like, they just take their ball and leave. Um, yeah. And in, in concerning this issue, I know, I, I know as a Willow family, yo, 
we we've had a we've had a long rough ride and people have left. So that's no indictment on people that have gone for other reasons of frustrations. But I just want to encourage the family, um, if at all possible by the grace of God, let's stay at the table and work through hard issues together. Um, work through challenging issues together, and let's repent to one another. Let's forgive one another. Where necessary, let's hold each other accountable. Let's let's hold each other accountable. So it's not a passive act. No, it's a very intentional, loving, grace-filled act that through it all, we carve out this beautiful thing called the beloved community of God, where one day eternally, we will stand together, every tribe, every race, and declare worthy is the lamb that was slain. Um, It's a hard conversation. And for some of you, this conversation was hard. Um, So I pray that God will give us the grace and the elasticity, if you will, to stretch in a way that helps us love one another better. Thanks, Dave, so much, man. I'm honored to be a part of the family. Well, thank you so much. And on behalf of everybody that's watching, we just want to say thank you for spending a little extra time with us. I so value the ability to be able to just pick up the phone and give you a call and say, hey, how do I think through this? You've helped us. You've made us better. Um, not, you know, not always easy conversations, but always fruitful. And we thank yeah. you so much for that. And we look forward to just developing our relationship that much more and even more to pursue that vision of multi-ethnic church, gospel-centered. It's a yeah. beautiful, beautiful dream. Uh, by the way, speaking of dream, you know, next time we have a conversation on race, uh, you know, I put a light switch behind me. I was trying to be the light of the world. You've got MLK behind you. I think you won. Uh, when it came to backdrop. You, know, you did a great job. I just have a light switch somebody put back here. But anyway, I've been trying. It took me an hour to come up with some sort of biblical reference, and I came up with the light of the world. So how about that? Anyway, God bless you. And uh, <laughs> we will talk soon. We can't wait till you can come and be here in person. Uh, we look so forward to having you. Oh, hold on. We have a prayer tomorrow. Oh, that's right. Anybody that is watching this, Albert, one of the things that we're going to do um, is tomorrow we're doing a prayer vigil uh, for Black Lives. And oh, wow. we are, we're going to be the information. I think they're going to put it up uh, on the screen here, uh, either when we're done or maybe as I'm talking. That's OK. You can put it over my face. That'd, that'd be an improvement. Um, but we're going to take some time as a community. And we're going to get together and we're going to pray together. Uh, we got some pretty creative things planned as well, but we're just going to honor. We're going to pray. We're going to repent. We're going to mourn. We're going to lament uh, together. And that was important for us to do. So anybody that's on this call, just be aware of that and uh, join us in that. And um, Albert, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Wow. Thanks so much, Dave. That's beautiful, man. I didn't know you guys were doing that. That's beautiful. Thank you. I- I usually don't talk in such language, but for the sake of the, the, the nature of the conversation, thank you so much to our white Christian siblings for showing up in this space and mourning with us, lamenting with us, and taking action with us. Um, we say your silence is deafening, but let me tell you, when you open your voice and when you speak, it's overwhelming with love and joy and hope for the future church. So thank you, Dave. Awesome. All right, everybody. Talk soon. See you later.